Well, hello YouTubers. Welcome back to my channel. I'm going to do a little fossil hunting video here uh, on preparation for fossil hunting and the equipment you need to go fossil hunting. Now, Leslie and I just got back from two weeks of fossil hunting in the White River Badlands of Nebraska, and we both found some stuff. We got some plaster jackets over here that contain the fossils we found out in the Badlands. Uh, this one's Leslie's. It has a, uh, a carnivore jaw in it, possibly some sort of 30 million year old primitive dog jaw. Um, this one's mine over here. And there is a 30 million year old tortoise in there in really good condition. It's going to be a beautiful specimen once it's prepped out. And then this one over here is an oreodont skull that I found as well. So we found some good stuff this year. And I just wanted to go over um, the kind of equipment and clothing you need to go fossil hunting out in the Badlands. And this is going to apply more or less to fossil hunting anywhere. I mean, if you're going hunting for dinosaurs in Wyoming or uh, Montana, or you're doing the, the Oligocene mammals in uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, or you're doing um, the, the, the fossilized plants in Colorado or Wyoming, you know, you're going to need, you're going to be in pretty much the similar environments and you're going to need similar equipment and clothing to get the job done. So we're going to start off with clothing. And I think we'll start at the bottom and work our way up and from the inside and work our way out. Okay. Uh, first thing you need is a really good pair of boots. Um, they need to be comfortable, good fitting, well broken in boots. Um, Timberlands work for me. Um, you may have your own favorite brand. I mean, they're not terribly expensive and they're comfortable and they're fairly rugged. And um, no matter what kind of boots you get, I would not go for the most expensive boots you can find because they probably won't last more than three seasons in the Badlands, okay? The Badlands destroys everything and they will destroy your boots no matter how much you paid for them. So don't overpay for them. Okay, but get a good pair of sturdy, rugged boots that fit well, and um, also get yourself some, some, some comfy socks and some liner socks to wear so you don't get blisters, because you're going to be walking over some really, really rough ground all day, every day when you're out in the Badlands, okay? You will get blisters, even in your comfy boots, so get some liner socks, too. I didn't bring those out, but Leslie and I each have several pairs of liner socks, and and nice comfy socks to wear over those. Um, I also treat the boots with some silicone water guard because you know you're going to get rained on, you're going to get snowed on, uh, you're going to be trudging through mud and uh, standing water so you don't want to have wet feet. Wet feet is just miserable so you know with silicone water guard to keep the boots more or less waterproof. They say they're waterproof coming from the factory I'll tell you what, that waterproofing doesn't last long. You've got to reapply this stuff to it regularly to keep them more or less waterproof. Okay, now for the rest of the clothing. Well, the name of the game is layers and tough outerwear. Okay, so tough outerwear and lots of layers because generally if you're fossil hunting in the Mountain West, you know, there's only a couple of seasons where you can do it. Maybe spring, maybe part of summer, maybe fall. Um, it's going to be generally cold in the morning and warm in the afternoon. So you're going to have to go out in lots of layers to start with and start peeling them off. But, of course, you can see warm and hot a couple of times a day. Um, when we're out there fossil hunting in the Badlands, it can start out freezing cold in the morning. Uh, it can warm up to broiling hot in the afternoon. And then a thunderstorm can come through and dump freezing cold water on you and hail maybe even snow, and then it'll clear up and it'll get broiling hot again, plus humid now. So it layers to the name of the game. So you got to have a lot of layers because you got to put on and take off as necessary to, to keep your body temperature right. And the clothes have to be tough. The outer layers have to be tough. Um, for pants, I like these uh, military surplus pants, uh, Army. Um, Marines, you can get these at uh, Army Navy surplus stores. I have a video of my shopping at um, Surplus City in Albuquerque. 
And a lot of the military clothing I have that I wear fossil hunting, I have bought at um, Surplus City. These pants, they're like canvas. They are tough as nails. They have a lot of pockets. Um, you're going to find yourself falling out in the Badlands. You're going to find yourself having to scoot down really steep slopes on rough ground. And, you know, you don't want to just go out there in your Levi's or a pair of short pants. Now, uh, everything out there has thorns. The Badlands is very, very rough. It's going to destroy your clothing. It's going to destroy your skin. It's going to give you road rash. You've got to cover up with something tough. And these military pants are a good start, at least up to the waist, okay? Above the pants, I'll wear a Columbia-type shirt, long sleeve. Because, you know, once it gets hot and you strip down, you still got to protect yourself from the sun. You got to take sunscreen with you, of course, but uh, just keep the direct sunlight from getting on your long sleeve Columbia type fishing shirt or something just to keep the, the sun off of you, but not really swaddle you in so much clothes that you're going to get hot if it's a hot, steamy day, okay? If, if it's going to be a freezing cold day, and I know it's going to be cold all day, it's never going to warm up to where it's going to be too hot, I might wear thermal underwear under, under the pants and under the shirt, okay, just for an extra layer. I might do that. Um, a hoodie, just, just, just a regular cheap hoodie um, over the shirt, and that will help keep me warm on the cold mornings or on cold days. And I could put the hood up over my head and protect my ears and whatnot. Um, as an outer jacket layer, I've got another military canvas jacket here. Again, I think I purchased it at Surplus City. Again, tough as nails. Um, canvas, tough as nails. Got a lot of pockets, which is really nice. And I treat this jacket with uh, the waterproofing too. Doesn't make it super waterproof, but it's enough to just keep me dry in a brief shower, okay? A lot of times you'll be out in the field all day and a brief shower or two will come through. And, you know, if your outer layer isn't kind of waterproof, it will tend to soak you. So I will treat this with the waterproofing just so most water will run off of it. But I also carry a raincoat with me. Now this raincoat is light enough and thin enough that I can roll this up tight and put it inside the pack I carry. And we'll talk more about the pack in a bit. But uh, it's also oversized. I bought this 3X raincoat just so I can put it on over all of this stuff in case a serious shower comes at me. And I know I'm going to get soaked to the bone. I can put this on over everything else I'm already wearing and keep everything dry. So... Yeah, get yourself an oversized raincoat and keep that with you just so you can throw it on real quick and keep everything dry. And then on top of your head, you need a hat, of course, because the sun is brutal out there. And the hat has to have a chin strap. It's, it's not optional. you got to have a chin strap. You will lose your hat a dozen times a day in the wind that blows out there in the Badlands. And if that you lose your hat, odds are it's going to fly off and go down into a crevice or a canyon that you can't get into to recover it. So, you know, you got to have the chin strap. In fact, we, a lot of times we go the extra mile of not only having the chin strap, but we will run the chin strap through the top button of our shirt so that, you know, when a bad gust hits you um, from behind, it won't blow the hat off and the chin strap off and everything, and you lose the hat. So it'll still be attached to your shirt. So you got to have a hat uh, and sunscreen, too, because it's brutal out there. Not only is the sun beating down on you from above, it's hitting that white Badlands material and reflecting back up on you from below. And if you're down in a valley in the Badlands, it's like you are in a broiler with the sun coming down at you from the top and both sides, double valley walls and the ground beneath you. It's just, you're just getting it from all directions. And um, it's not only reflecting the heat at you, it's reflecting the UV. So you've got to protect yourself from the UV. It's really bad out there. Okay, and then there's gloves. Um, I've got two pairs of gloves I'll carry with me. 
Um, these are cold weather gloves. I might actually leave them behind on warmer days. These are for days when it is super, super cold out in the Badlands. And that happens a lot, at least in the mornings. Uh, but some days it can be super cold all day long. These are deerskin lined gloves. They are buttery soft and super, super warm. They're the, one of the best investments I ever made. They're a little pricey, but they're worth it. They will keep your hands warm in just about any weather. Then I've got a, a, just like a cheap pair of mechanics gloves here. Um, these are what I'm going to wear most of the time when I'm in the Badlands. You've got to wear gloves because the surface of the Badlands is very, very rough. And you're going to be scrambling, you're going to be climbing, you're going to be falling from time to time. And you will get road rash on your hands and arms when you fall if you, they aren't covered with something. Plus, it's generally cold. Um, it's generally, you know, just miserable out in the Badlands, and you do want to show as little skin as possible. So you'll be wearing gloves pretty much all day. And uh, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll cut the fingertips, at least some of the fingertips off their gloves, so they have a little more dexterity for uh, picking up and manipulating small items. And that's really not a bad idea. Uh, I just bought these gloves because I wore out my old gloves because they were just all torn up from being out in the Badlands for a couple seasons. And I just haven't got around to cutting the fingertips off of these yet. I won't cut the fingertips off my keep my fingers warm gloves, but off my working gloves, I might do that just so I can pick up small fossils and teeth and bits of bone and whatnot. Um, but yeah, you got to wear gloves all the time, or your hands will be destroyed after a couple days in the Badlands. Knee pads, another must. Um, like I say, you're going to fall. You're going to have to scramble on hands and knees from time to time. Um, you're going to be down on your knees digging. And the Badlands, the surface of the Badlands is unforgiving. It will destroy your knees. So you got to have knee pads. Uh, this is just a cheap pair of knee pads held on with Velcro. They work great for me, you know. Um, another item a lot of people wear is just like a carpenter's nail apron. And I, I generally wear one. Uh, just it's a good place. It's got two big pockets on the front of it, and it's a good place to just drop um, Small items as you find them into it and just keep them organized, you know, or as I'm a Lot of times I'll take lunch out into the field and it'll be like a hand lunch something I can eat while I'm walking and hunting and there I can I can put uh, Wrappers and plastic and whatnot in here just so I don't pollute the field I can put my trash in one end and any small fossils I find I can put in the other pocket just, just so I can, you know, keep the field clean. And then the last item of, that you're going to want to take with you is a sturdy walking stick. Um, the surface of the Badlands is treacherous. It's crumbly. It's steep. It's uneven. It's very treacherous. Having a third point of contact with the ground helps a lot and prevents falls and makes them a lot less damaging, okay? By having a third point of contact on the ground. A lot of us just use like a shovel handle from the hardware store. You go in, get a, a nice sturdy shovel handle. Um, this one happens to be metal tipped, which helps. And uh, we'll make a, a hand grip where you normally hold on to it with, with just with duct tape, just to give it a little more grip on there. Although my gloves down here are very grippy. They grip the, the bare wood nicely, but you can't have enough grip on your stick because you don't want to lose it. Again, like your hat, if you lose your stick, it's liable to tumble down a hill 100 feet into a crevasse where you can't get it again. So you don't want to lose your stick. The sticks come in handy for other things too. Um, sometimes we'll be moving a heavy jacket out. Like this jacket here probably weighs around 100 pounds. And what we'll do is we'll get a cargo net and we'll string it between a few sticks and we'll get... Um, a guy on each end of each stick and we'll carry it up out of the Badlands. We may have to cl climb up out of the Badlands by 100, 150 feet up really bad ground. So, you know, you can make yourself um, sort of like a stretcher for the heavy jackets that way and get several guys together and pull them out. And also, um, speaking of stretchers, if we have an injured person, we can put the sticks together and we can either use the cargo nets or, in a dire emergency, we can take our pants off and string the, the sticks through the legs of the pants and make a stretcher that way. 
and haul an injured person up out of the Badlands as long as there's enough of us there to, to lift the person and haul them out. So that's a, that's a possibility too. So keep that in mind. The stick is very important. It has multiple, multiple uses, all of them very important. Um, also, as you're walking along, sometimes you're walking through uh, thick grass. Um, if it's hot, there's going to be snakes. So it's good to, to poke the stick ahead of you and uh, see what's ahead of you rather than just sort of charging through the thick grass. So that's pretty much all for apparel and uh, minor accessories. Now we'll talk about the pack and the tools and... Um, supplies you're going to need to take with you. Okay, now that we've gone over what I wear in the field, I will go over what I carry in the field in my pack. So here's my pack. It's just a cheap backpack. I think it's what, Fuel Brand? Had it forever. It's not really ideal for this, but it was a backpack I had that wasn't doing anything else, so it, it wound up becoming my fossil hunting backpack by default. I wish it had a few more pockets. I wish it had some netting on it. Um, you know, I, I do attach carabiners to it so I can carry other things on it easy enough. I can just attach them to the carabiners. But uh, yeah, it's not ideal, but you know, it's, it, I already had it and it works, okay? I know where everything is. I've got certain pockets I put stuff in. Um, it's gonna be quite heavy once you first get out in the field early in the morning. But of course, early in the morning, you're still fresh. You can carry a heavy pack. Over time, it's gonna get lighter as you use up your supplies. So we'll go over the supplies too. Now we already talked about gloves, knee pads, nail apron. Now I store this stuff in my pack when I'm not in the field. Generally, it's all on my body before I go in the field. Um, so that makes the pack a little less bulky and a little bit lighter by putting this stuff on my body before I go out in the field. Now I also carry, you're going to need a rock hammer. So I've got a nice S-wing rock hammer here with a, uh, a belt holster. So I'll also take this out of the pack. I store it in the pack, but I'll generally take it out of the pack and put it on, on my belt before I go out in the field too. That's going to make the pack lighter. Um, it also has it in hand. I don't have to dig through the pack to get it if I see something I need to probe around at with the, with the rock hammer. Um, also, I've got a, uh, a nice ice pick with a sheath for the tip because you want to get one with a sheath. Now you can spend as much or as little on an ice pick as you want. I mean, I got a cheap one. Some people have the fancy schmancy ones with the knurled brass handles and a, and a brass cover that screws on. You can go that way if you want. I just got a cheap ice pick. You're gonna use the ice pick more than anything else to probe around. You see a little bit of bone sticking out of the Badlands matrix, you're going to probe around and see if, there, if it's the beginning of something or if it's just a random chunk of bone eroding out. You know, um, there might be a whole skull underneath that. There might be, you know, a femur, or it might just be a chunk of bone that doesn't amount to anything. But you've got to probe around. An ice pick is a perfect tool for the job. So I will normally pocket the ice pick in its sheath and a paintbrush. So those will go on me, out of the pack, I store again, I store them in the pack when I'm not in the field. Once I go in the field, these are on me, okay? And this is sort of the minimum gear you need to fossil hunt right here, okay? The gloves, the knee pads, the nail apron, the rock hammer, um, a paintbrush, and an ice pick, okay? That's kind of the minimum gear you need. And you know what? I'll have all that on my body. Then I can drop my heavy pack full of all this other stuff, which we'll talk about in a minute, and just go hunting. And I can look around and see if I can find something worth digging. And if I find something worth digging where I need all this other equipment, I'll come back and get the pack, I'll drag it over to where I found the thing, and I'll get to work on it there. But I won't carry all this other heavy stuff around with me all day long. I'll just carry it out into the field and then drop the pack once I've got all this stuff on me, and then go hunting. And then we'll talk about this other stuff. So what we've got here, this other stuff, is what you need to extract fossils from the ground and just survive, and just in general survive in the field all day long 
away from your trucks and your buddies and whatnot and civilization. So, um, got some digging stuff here, um, some variety of chisels. Um, wood chisels, it's terribly abusive on wood chisels to use them to chisel through the matrix, but actually if the matrix is not too hard, the wood chisels work really good for chiseling stuff out of the matrix. If you get into some really hard matrix, you need a proper um, masonry chisel. So I got one of those too. Um, I've also got um, a pry bar here, and what this is good for is getting underneath fossils after you've jacketed the top of them to break them loose from the matrix. Just pound your chisels and your pry bar underneath it to break them loose from the matrix so you can flip it over then and get it out after you've already put a plaster jacket on it. So that's what this stuff really comes in handy for, for both digging and for um, breaking the fossils loose from the matrix once you have them jacketed. Uh, got a magic marker up here. That's important. So you, you mark your Mark your jackets, whether you're making a big plaster jacket like this or just an aluminum foil jacket in a plastic bag, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Mark them so you remember what they are, because you may not get around to prepping this stuff for years, maybe even decades, and you'll look at it and go, oh, what the heck was that? Is that an Oreodon skull? Is that a tortoise? Is that, is that a saber cat? What is it? you got to mark them so you can look at it and say, oh, okay, yeah, that's my tortoise. That's my Oreodon skull. That's Leslie's dog jaw. Okay, so we know what they are. We also put a date on them generally when they were found, again, because it may be years before we get around to doing the prep work on these. Maybe when we're too old and feeble to still go out in the badlands. Then we'll start the serious prep work. Okay, uh, you got to have at least one good knife. I've got a, a DeWalt folding knife here. Inexpensive, works great. Um, knives come in handy for lots of things, everything from, well, you know how useful knives are. I also have a, um, I also have a Leatherman tool that I actually won in a little contest on Instructable. So I carry that with me. It doesn't take up a lot of space. doesn't add a lot of weight. I just throw it in the, in the pack just in case I need one of the many tools it contains. I'll have it with me. Uh, got some bungee cords. Uh, bungee cords come in handy for lots of things. Um, we talked about all the layering you need to do with clothing out in the Badlands, because it can be everywhere from sub-freezing to 120 degrees, and you got to, in the same day, okay? So you've got to be in layers, and as you strip layers off, you got to have some way to wrangle those layers so they don't blow away. So I'll wrap, I'll, I'll take off a coat, and I'll roll it up tight, and I'll wrap a bungee cord around it real tight, and then I will clip it to one of the carabiners on my pack, just so the wind can't blow it away, because the wind is always howling out in the Badlands, it seems like. And, you know, you don't want to have loose clothing laying around that the wind can catch and blow away. So I will bungee it to the pack, you know. So, and bungee cords come in handy for other things. You can bungee all kinds of stuff together just to hold on to it and organize it. Uh, got uh, some small containers, some pill bottles and stuff. They come in handy for um, small fossils. Um, you can protect them with some, either some paper towel or some toilet paper uh, so they don't rattle around in there too much. In fact, I was setting this stuff up. I forgot that this one and this one, they both still have small fossils in them. I need to empty out and put with my fossil collection. So I'm glad I, I emptied my pack out for this video because I found that I still had some fossils in there I didn't know about. Uh, this pill container here has some uh, um, duct tape rolled around it. Um, that's easier than taking a whole duct tape roll into the field. It's lighter and takes up less space in the pack. And the duct tape comes in handy along with the aluminum foil. Sometimes if you've got a small fossil that's not worth the effort of making a big plaster jacket of, what you can do is you can wrap it in layers of aluminum foil and then cover it with duct tape and put it in a plastic bag and write on the plastic bag what it is with your marker. And that's one way to deal with smaller fossils that, that don't need the whole plaster jacket mumbo-jumbo. Um, the aluminum foil also is necessary when you are making a plaster jacket because after you expose the fossil, you want to cover it with aluminum foil so you don't get plaster on it. So the, pla the aluminum foil is like a parting material between the fossil and the plaster jacket. So you cover it with aluminum foil first and then you make the, the plaster and burlap jacket around it 
and you don't wind up with plaster stuck to your precious fossil. So you got to carry aluminum foil into the field. It's very useful. Water. Well, you're going to be out in the Badlands all day. You're going to need a fair amount of water. I mean, this is the minimum amount of water I ever take into the Badlands. That's two and a half liters right there. Uh, if it's a hot day, I may sneak a few more of these small bottles into various pockets on my pack and uh, my cargo pants or my jacket or whatever, just so I have them with me, because we generally operate sometimes miles away from our vehicles and any other supplies, and you don't want to have to be, you know, bumming the water off your buddies or drinking the nasty water we take out in the field to make the plaster jackets with, because that's, that's nasty, barely potable water. So you got to have some good drinking water with you. Like I say, two and a half liters is the minimum I ever take with me. Uh, sometimes I'll take more. Now some people like um, metal canteens and metal and other metal containers for their water. That's fine. I prefer the plastic containers for a couple reasons. Um, as I drink out of them and uh, the, the amount of liquid inside diminishes, I can crush them flatter. And that makes more room in the pack. Because usually when you're coming out of the field, you're carrying stuff you found and you need room in the pack. You know, if you've made some aluminum foil and uh, duct tape jackets and you're carrying them in your pack, you need room. And, you know, you can crush these down. If you've got metal canteens, they're not going to crush down any smaller. They're going to take up the same amount of space in your pack they did when they were full. Um, also, as uh, I drink out of these, I can crush them down and I could slip them into the pockets of either my cargo pants or my jacket, whatever I'm wearing, and I don't have to dig it out of the pack again when I want another drink. It's on me, okay? And I can, I can hike for miles away from the pack and still have water with me. So that's another reason I like these plastic containers because I can crush them down as I empty them. Got a plastic bag with a big wad of toilet paper in it. Okay, I don't have to explain to you what the toilet paper is for. You're miles from anywhere, Nature may call. It comes in handy, but it also has other uses. You can use it to pad small, delicate things before you put them in your storage bottles over here, just so they don't rattle around and break. Fossils are very delicate. They may have survived for 30 million years out there, but you pick it up and put it in a bottle like this and rattle it around all day, it'll be dust, okay? So, you know, the toilet paper comes in handy for padding, too. Uh, flashlight, in case you're out in the field after dark, or headlamp. Either one, or for poking into dark nooks and crannies, which sometimes might have rattlesnakes or scorpions in them. You might want to take a good look before you stick your hand in there, you know? Uh, also, like I say, if you're out in the field after dark, it happens sometimes. Somebody finds something good. You know, we're all out there working on it. Before you know it, the sun's setting, it's getting dark, and, you know, you've got a long hike back to the entry point, and uh, flashlights, they'll save your life, you know? Uh, sunscreen? I carry sunscreen with me because if it's a sunny day out in the Badlands, um, you're going to need to reapply this a couple of times generally. Otherwise, you will get burnt to a crisp. I talked earlier about how the UV ref light reflects off the ground as well as coming down from above. It's like being on snow. You get burnt to a crisp. You've got to reapply your sunscreen every once in a while. Hot hands packets. Just in case it's a super cold day out there, you can put these inside your gloves and keep your keep your hands warm. You can put these inside your socks and keep your feet warm. There have been days out in the field where it has been super cold and super wet and super nasty where I have been walking around with six or eight hot hands on me and they have kept me going. Otherwise I would have had to retire from the field just because it was so miserable and cold and wet and nasty. Uh, so the hot hands, they help. Um, that's my lunchbox over there. It's just a little... Um, just a little cup Tupperware container. Um, just big enough to put like a sandwich and some chips or pretzels. I prefer pretzels. Um, or uh, granola bar or um, some jerky or something like that in there. A lot of times I'll carry an apple too. I'll just stick that in one of the pockets in the pack and I'll eat that. I, I particularly like to take canned food out there with me like uh, granola bars or apples or whatever that I could eat while I'm hunting. You want to maximize your amount of time hunting it while you're out in the field because it's so hard to get in and so hard to get out. And um, there's only so many hours in the day. So I can walk and eat an apple. 
I, and hunt. I can walk and eat a granola bar and hunt, you know. Now, I may sit down for a little while, maybe with my wife. We'll meet somewhere and sit down for a few minutes, talk, you know, eat the chips and the whatnot. But then, you know, we'll go off and we'll hunt while we're eating the granola bars or the apples or whatever. So just, just a little lunch because so, you're going to be out there probably from uh, early morning till sunset. You're going to get hungry. You're going to expend a lot of calories out there walking around in the Badlands. So you've got to take some food with you. Um, plastic bags. Plastic bags come in handy for, you know, Ziploc bags come in handy for um, putting small things in. You know, wrap them in either the toilet paper first or wrap them in multiple layers of aluminum and put some uh, duct tape around them and then put them in a plastic bag. Label the plastic bag what it is, you know. Uh, also, uh, in the bags, I have um, rubber gloves, surgical gloves. Those come in handy when you are mixing up the plaster for the plaster jackets because you don't really don't want to get that on your hands. It's, it's very harsh on the hands and... Uh, yeah, so we all carry gloves with us of some sort just for use with the, mixing up the plaster. They have to be waterproof, generally disposable. Surgical gloves are good, um, like uh, dishwashing gloves that come up to your, up here are good for that. You'll, you'll get even less mess on you if you use those kind of gloves. A lot of us do. And uh, there's a few things here, there's a few things that aren't here that go with me too. Um, we all carry walkie-talkies with us into the field so we can communicate with each other, let each other know where we are, call for help if we have a problem. The leader of the expedition can give us orders on where the limits of our, our, our travels are for today, what's inbounds, what's out of bounds. Um, he can tell us that it's time to leave, whatever, that kind of thing. Tell us the bad weather's coming in, we need to gather back at the rally point or whatever. Uh, so we all have walkie-talkies. Uh, we also all carry very loud whistles, which I don't have with me right now. Um, just in case, you know, we fall down a crevasse or in a hole or get lost or whatever, and we can just blow on that whistle, and you can hear it for a long ways off. So it's just a safety device, just so that, uh, you know, we don't lose anybody out there, because the Badlands are huge, and it's really easy. You can get 30 feet away from somebody and they can't see you. You know, you gotta, you got to find a way to uh, make your presence known if you're in trouble. So we've got uh, the whistles and the walkie-talkies. Um, we also all carry a bottle of boot bar glue, which I don't have with me because we, we leave that with the uh, expedition leader when we're done. So I'll show you a picture of the boot bar glue, though. So it's about a quart, um, adds a little weight to the pack, but the boot bar glue is very important. It holds the fossils together because I think I said earlier, they're very fragile, very friable. Um, and you find something you want to keep it, first you coat it with boot bar glue and let it harden. And then you can uh, package it up either, you know, in a big plaster jacket if necessary, or in a smaller aluminum foil and duct tape jacket. Now, speaking of the plaster jackets, there's a lot of material we also carry into the field as a group. But uh, it's not individual stuff. We all have our own individual stuff that we carry. And, you know, over the years, I have really pared back. The, every time I go out into the field, I carry less because I find that there's stuff that I've hauled around in my pack for years that I haven't used. And I'm like, why am I carrying this dead weight around every year? Throw it out. You know, I used to carry a first aid kit. I just leave that in the truck now, um, just because I haven't used it in years. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe maybe a minor cut or, or scrape or something. You know, if it's bleeding and it won't quit, I'll just wrap it with some toilet paper, put some duct tape on it, make a field bandage, and move on with life. You know, get the uh, first aid kit out. If it's something that we need the first aid kit for, we're probably going to have to leave the field anyway. So leave it in the truck. But we have other stuff that we... Uh, that we carry out as a group. We carry out all the material for making the plaster jackets as a group and we leave it in one central location. Um, there's green bags full of plaster and burlap and um, bottles full of water. And again, it's the barely potable skunky water. We don't bother using our good drinking water for making plaster jackets unless it's absolutely necessary. But we'll, we'll save old bottles and we'll fill them with the skunky water that we can get out there 
and um, we'll use that for making the plaster jackets. So we'll take all that material. Also the cargo nets, we have cargo nets with us. All that we'll carry out as a group. We'll parcel it out amongst everybody because it's usually a long walk out into the Badlands from wherever we're entering. You can't really drive out there and there are limited entry points and um, usually it's a very long walk out there and we'll parcel the stuff out. Everybody will carry a couple of green bags. Um, everybody will carry a couple of bottles of the water for the plaster. Um, somebody will carry the, uh, maybe two people will carry the, the box that has the cargo nets and other stuff in it. We'll carry, um, sometimes if we make it a very large jacket, we may need to reinforce it with wood. wood. So uh, the, we'll have a bundle of wood stakes with us. So all that has to go out in the field. We'll carry that all out as a group. We'll parcel out amongst everybody, carry it out there. Once we get to a central location in the Badlands, we'll drop all that stuff off. And if somebody finds something and they need to make a plaster jacket um, or they need the cargo net, they can go to that central location and get it. But we're not going to carry it all over the back of beyond. It's just too much trouble. And like I said, I tend to just drop my pack too and just carry sort of the minimum amount of equipment around as I hunt. And then when I find something, I come back and get the pack so that I have all of this other stuff. You know, and by the end of the day, I've generally drunk all my water, ate my lunch. Um, the pack's a lot lighter after that. And you know, you're really dragging by the end of the day. It's much easier to get out of the Badlands <laughs> with all that weight gone, you know? So anyway, that's kind of um, how I do the fossil hunting, and I think it's probably going to be similar for most people, no matter what you're doing. Uh, so if you want to get into fossil hunting, you know, this is the kind of equipment you need, and we talked about the kind of apparel you're going to need. It's got to be tough. It's got to be tough because the Badlands are murder on everything. So anyway, I hope you found this video a little bit informative, educational, inspirational, killed some time, made you want to get out and do some fossil hunting whatever. Give the video a thumbs up, give it a like, and subscribe to see my future videos. There will be more. There's going to be a lot of fossil hunting videos coming out because we spent two weeks out in the Badlands. And um, subscribe to see my future videos and check out my second channel, Electro Geek 64. Good stuff going on there. And I will see you in the next video. Thanks a lot. Bye.